All right, we are done with attendance. We've got time to spare. Let's see if anyone shows up. Does anybody have any questions about anything while we're waiting before we can officially start? Uh-huh. Interesting. Because so, th does it show your grade? It shows my grade, yes, but a few at the end say not grade. Oh, so the extra credit ones aren't graded through um, through Moodle. So what I did with the extra credit questions is I manually graded those and I added your points at the end. So if you look at like what your grade is, if you look at the exam and look what you scored versus what your grade is in the grade book, probably your grade in the grade book's a little bit higher because that's I manually added the extra credit. So you're talking about like little square, the gray square is at the bottom basically, right? It says not graded. Yeah, I don't know how, I don't know why I did it that way. I'm still learning how to work with Moodle, but everybody did get their points. That's a good question. I just had to do it manually, which is a real pain, but it helps. Good question. Any other questions? Um, and like I said in the announcement, um, I am going to open it. It should be open already, but I'm going to double check and make sure that it is open for you to retake. It's just like the first time. There's no reason not to retake it. You retake it as many times as you want. The retake is open book. The retake is not timed. Um, if for some weird reason you were to get lower on the retake than you did the first time, I don't know how, but if that were to happen, then we would just keep your first original score. So feel free to retake it. Um, what are some other announcements? The other important thing is they are giving me a new laptop today at 9 a.m. So if you need me, I don't know how long that's going to take. So I might be, I mean, I'll be in my office, but I might be without a computer for who knows how long. Which means I will not be online for office hours today. Any questions or Okay, let's jump into it then. Back into chapter nine. So what we had finished talking about was, well, hold on, I guess first I'll do the first attendance word, um, which will be red. Mm, let's just do extra credit today. For those of you in person, if you're online, as usual, those are your actual words for attendance. But yes, the first word is red. I have the color of my shirt and the Terminator's eye. Anyway, what we were talking about, what we had finished talking about was transcription, right? We were saying transcription is that process where we go from DNA to RNA, right? Transcription is that process where we read the code in the RNA and make a complementary strand of the RNA. Once we were done talking about that, then we said the transcription is broken down into three stages. The first stage is initiation, which happens right here at the promoter, right? The second stage is elongation, which is where the RNA polymerase just keeps moving down the RNA and, or down the DNA and produces RNA. And then finally, we get to this last phase that we're talking about right now, which is termination. So you need to know that, right? You need to know the three stages of transcription. You need to know their names, you need to know their order, and you need to know what happens in those stages. And also, you need to know where um, termination of transcription happens. And this one's easy, it happens at the terminator. So termination happens at the terminator, nice and easy, right? If it were up to me, I would change everything and call the promoter the initiator. That would make more sense too, right? A lot easier to study. Where does initiation start? Happens at the initiator. But that's not what we call it. It's called the promoter. So initiation starts at the promoter. Initiation of transcription starts at the promoter. Um, and termination of transcription starts at the term or happens at the terminator. So any questions about that? All right. There's at least one question in the study guide, and there might be a question on the exam where it says something like, what would happen if there was a mutation in the terminator? Right? Because it's all just a bunch of codes, right? A's, C's, T's, and G's. There's something there at the terminator, some code, those A's, C's, T's, and G's that tell the RNA polymerates, all right, my job is done, right? So what is it that's causing that? Um, anyway, the question on the exam, or at least the study guide, excuse me, says something like, what if there was a mutation where that doesn't say, hey, stop this process? 
So what would be the process? What would be the result if there was a mutation where there was no terminator? Anyone want to venture to guess? What would happen if there was no terminator? There's a mutation and the terminator code does not say stop. What would we be left with? A longer strand of RNA, a shorter strand of DNA. What do you guys think? Don't overthink it. Hopefully you figured it out. You're just too uh, embarrassed. Well, not embarrassed, but too shy to say. Because it's really not that hard. The thing failed to say stop. And the RNA polymerase would just keep reading it and keep going. Therefore, it would result in a longer strand of RNA. Hopefully that makes sense, right? It's supposed to go from here to here, right? So let's just say it produced an RNA strand that long. But if you got rid of the terminator, it would just keep going, right? And that's how long your RNA strand would be. Anyway, so that's transcription. Any questions about transcription? Right out, right there it is in, in one picture. Again, RNA polymerase attaches to the promoter. That's initiation. And it starts moving down the strand of DNA. It's reading the code. It's, well, it's opening it up. It's opening, the, opening up the DNA. It's reading the code. It's making a strand of RNA. And then when it's all done, when it hits the terminator, the RNA polymerase leaves. The, the RNA goes its own way, and the DNA comes back together. And that's it. It's pretty simple. Well, the way we're teaching it is pretty simple. It's actually pretty complicated, but this is a very simple way of looking at it. All right. Um, if you download the PowerPoint, you can watch this little animation that shows shows it in action. And that brings us to the next stage. So remember, big picture here. Big picture. Things we would talk about on Wednesday and maybe even Monday. I don't remember. Um, the whole process we're talking about going from DNA to RNA to protein, right? This is the whole big picture we're, we're talking about. <clears throat> so going from DNA to RNA is called transcription. Going from RNA to protein is called translation, right? We've already learned that. What we're looking at now is we're kind of in between this DNA to RNA situation and the RNA to protein situation, right? There's somewhere in between because this RNA that we just talked about producing in the transcription, it has to be processed before it can be translated into um, proteins. And that's what we're going to talk about right here. So I'm not going to test you on this. Well, maybe, maybe um, an extra credit question. But that first bullet point, I'm not going to test you on. At least not the prokaryote part, but prokaryotes don't have nucleus. They don't have nuclei, right? So when their RNA is transcribed, they can just be translated right away because it's not in anything, right? It's just out there in the cell. Just, so once that gets transcribed, that RNA can be translated. That's not the case with eukaryotes. So this test is going to be based on eukaryotes. I'm not going to say that, but you know, you can just assume it. So all the questions, it's not going to say in a eukaryotic cell, what happens, blah, 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 right? I'm not going to say that. Just know that it's going to be eukaryotic. So everything we're talking about is for eukaryotic cells. But anyway, this mRNA that was produced, excuse me, the RNA that was produced is called mRNA. And that's one of those things you need to know for the exam. So I guess the X was kind of stupid now that I'm thinking about it. Let's see if I can undo that. So the prokaryote part of what I X'd out is what I'm not going to test you on. You definitely need to know the name of the RNA. It is mRNA. Right, so when we transcribe DNA, it results in mRNA. That in itself sounds pretty simple, but there's other RNAs that you need to know for this chapter too. So write that down, make sure you, you know the difference between the different types of RNA. So the first one I'm introducing you to is mRNA. It is the messenger. It is the thing passing the message, right? So the DNA is the message, right, RNA. This mRNA is the messenger. It's taking that message to the parts that we're going to talk about later so it can be translated into a protein. So another good test question that I mentioned on Wednesday, I think. Uh, where does transcription happen? It happens in the nucleus. Okay? Where does translation happen? It happens outside of the nucleus. You need to know that for the exam. And like I said earlier, it does need to be modified, and that's what we're about to talk about is how it gets modified before it leaves the nucleus. Anyway, for extra, not extra credit, but for independent work, you might want to look that up. So everything I'm about to tell you is how eukaryotes do it. So what about prokaryotes? How does it work? You can look that up if you want for, um, for independent work. Anyway, any questions about that slide? 
All right. First thing that happens is something called cap and tail. So you need to know this. This is one of the um, RNA modifications. Cap and tail is the addition of extra nucleotides at the end of the RNA. So we have additions there at one end, and then a bunch of A's, we have an addition at the other end. Now, you don't need to know that the cap is on the five prime side or that the poly A tail is at the three prime side. You don't need to know that. All you need to know is that cap and tail is on both ends just get extra nucleotides at the end. You also need to know why that happens because it protects it from attack by enzymes and helps ribosomes recognize the RNA as mRNA. So it's a good time for me to remind you. Um, again, there are different types of RNA that I'm going to teach you about later. So your cells need to be able to tell the difference between the, the different types. This is the only type of RNA that your cells are supposed to read and translate into a protein, right? So for that reason, it needs to be able to recognize this as mRNA as opposed to the other types of RNA that you're going to learn about later. Another thing worth mentioning, and we haven't gotten to it yet, is think about things like viruses. Um, viruses are basically either mRNA, excuse me, viruses are either RNA like this or they're DNA. Either way, it's a genetic code getting hijacked, right? It's a, it's a genetic code that hijacks your cells. Um, so your cells obviously want to be able to recognize genetic material that doesn't belong there, right? So generally speaking, when it works, your cells will see a viral bit of uh, genetic information, whether it be RNA or DNA, and attack it, right? So this is another thing that the cap and tail does. It protects your cells from attacking it. Because again, foreign genetic material, whether it be RNA or DNA, is not a good thing. So your cells should attack it and destroy it. Obviously, we don't want to attack and destroy the mRNA because we want to translate that into protein. Any questions so far? All right, that'll be the next word for attendance, cap, right there. All right, the other RNA processing is called splicing. RNA splicing. What that does is remove non-coding parts. So I hate to use this term because it's not necessarily true, but the way we talk about this is a fine word because for us it is, but anyway, there's stuff that I'm going to call junk DNA, right? There's stuff that doesn't necessarily code for anything. So that junk DNA is transcribed and copied into the mRNA, right? So then that junk, those junk codes are also included in the mRNA. But your body, your cells know that they don't belong there, so they cut them out, and that is what RNA splicing is. The way it gets harder is uh, you have to know the names of them. So the junk, the non-coding stuff is called the introns, and the stuff that is coded, the stuff we're actually after is called exons. So the test question will be something like, you know, RNA splicing removes what? And the answer is introns. RNA splicing re do, re removes introns. Historically, that's one of these questions that usually trips people up. I get it, because intron sounds like you would leave it in, but you don't. So here's how they got their names. Exons are the parts that get expressed. That RNA gets expressed. It turns into protein. Introns is just the junk in between. So hopefully that helps you remember. In between is the junk. Exons get expressed. That's, uh, that's one of those more complicated things. I can see how people mess it up. So that's the answer. Or that's, that's what you need to know for the exam. Speaking of, speaking of which, and speaking of exams, when you go to retake your exam, I'm going to go ahead and give you this little bit of information, like I said in the lecture weeks ago. Photosynthesis happens in chloroplast, and respiration happens in uh, uh, mitochondria. Please don't get that one wrong again. I was hoping that would be an easy question. Anyway, RNA splicing. We're still talking about it. Um, the exons and the introns are, uh, excuse me, transcribed from our DNA to RNA. We already said that, that we had to remove the intron. We already said all that. So everything I just said, right there it is in, in writing. But here's where it gets a little bit more complicated. Because RNA splicing doesn't just get rid of introns. I mean, it does that. But it also 
is responsible for the fact that there are, uh, let's see, significant role in humans is about 21,000 genes. So we have about 21,000 genes, but we produce many more polypeptides. So think about that for a second. Genes are instructions on how to build proteins. Every protein in your body that you built came from a gene, right? Because the gene said that's how you build the protein. But we only have 21,000 genes, but there's a lot more proteins that we build. So how does that happen, right? How is it that we only have about 21,000 sets of instructions on how to build proteins, yet we have more than 21,000 proteins? And the answer is alternative splicing. Which I'll come back to that. Excuse me. This is in the wrong spot. But anyway, let me back up a second. So this is just regular old splicing, like we said, like we were talking about earlier. You can just now see it in action. You've got your DNA up top, right, that has all the junk stuff. It has the exons and the introns. We don't need the introns. That's the in-between junk stuff. Um, we get the cap. We get the tail. We get rid of the introns. We put it back together. Then the mRNA can leave the cell. That slide should have been later, but here we go. Yes. So this is alternative splicing. This goes back to this idea of how is it that we have about 21,000 genes, but we have many more proteins. And this is the answer. So this is a simplified version. This is not from your textbook, but this particular gene we're looking at has five exons, right? And it has what? One, two, three, four introns that we're looking at. So alternative splicing is basically saying, yes, we're removing the introns, but we don't always remove all of them. So this one on the left, in that case, they did remove all of them. Actually, let me say something. I'll, I'll put that differently because this picture is showing it differently. We don't always keep all the exons, right? So in this example on the left, we did keep all the exons. Exon 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. This one here, when we did the alternative splicing, we left out exon number 3. As you can see, it goes from 1 to 2 and then skips to 4 and 5. And just leaving out that one exon now gives us, you can see the difference between protein A and protein B. I don't expect you to know what those pictures mean, what all those little zigzags mean. That's okay, but you can see just by looking that it's different, right? You can see this is a different shape than this. And if you remember from way back when we first started talking about proteins, the shape is the most important thing about a protein, right? It's all about the shape. So here we go. We left out one exon, and now we have a completely different protein, right? And then this one, on the way on, all the way on the right, we left out exon number four. And once again, it's a completely different protein with a completely different shape, therefore a completely different function. So there you go. That is alternative splicing. And keep in mind, too, this is a simplified version, right? This is only showing five exons. There's so many more, which is also another good independent work topic. How long is the typical gene? Um, how many exons are in a typical gene? How many introns are in a typical gene? You can look all that up. You don't need to know it, but you could for independent work. Anyway, any questions about alternative splicing? So again, long story short, with alternative splicing, sometimes we can leave out some exons, and in doing so, we can get different proteins. So one gene actually codes for different proteins, depending on how the um, RNA is spliced. Uh, excuse me. Any questions about that side? All right. So now we can finally talk about translation. So remember this big, again, big picture. The big picture is we're talking about going from DNA to RNA to protein. We've already talked about going from DNA to RNA, which is called transcription. Then, or excuse me, the process, the product, the transcription is the mRNA, right? So the thing we just talked about was how that mRNA is processed. So it can leave the nucleus so that it can be translated. And now finally we can talk about translation. Um, in your old textbook, and again, I'm basing this PowerPoint off of the old textbook, so it's the same information, just presented in a different way. I like the old textbook because first it talks about the pieces of translation. Translation is a little bit more complicated than transcription, at least the way we learn it, right? So first, this textbook talks about the parts, and then once you understand the parts, then we start talking about the process. And the way the old textbook talked about it was called the players and the process. So let's talk about the players. That'll be the next word for attendance. Players. All right. So here we are. We're talking about the parts. The one of the first important parts is the one we just got finished talking about. It's the mRNA, right? That's the stuff that was produced in transcription, right? When 
the RNA polymerase attached to the DNA, it was making a strand of mRNA. And then the mRNA was uh, modified, like we just talked about, right? The cap and the tail and the splicing. So yes, obviously that is one of the important ingredients. Um, then there's the machine that translates the mRNA. We'll talk about that later. Obviously, we're going to require a bunch of enzymes, as we do for almost anything that happens in a cell, and energy, as that happens almost any time in a cell. But it also requires two other components, which are ribosomes and transfer RNA. So let me underline some stuff here. You need to know that mRNA is one of the parts of translation. You need to know that ribosomes are the other part. Actually, I need to fix this PowerPoint. This is stupid. Because the machine that does the translating, those are called ribosomes. Um, and then there's this other type of RNA. So again, to remind you, there's three types of RNA. There's more than three types of RNA. But you're going to learn about three types of RNA. And you need to know the difference between them. So we've already talked about mRNA, which is the product of transcription. Then there's this stuff called tRNA, the transfer RNA. Any idea? Let's see if anybody can guess this. This would be pretty impressive if you could. Does anybody know what that tRNA is transferring? Okay, I'm not disappointed. I get, I uh, understand that nobody could guess that. But let me see if I can give you some hints. So what we have here is mRNA, and we're trying to translate that to build a protein, right? So we're building a protein, which means we are building a polymer made up of monomers. So we need a certain type of monomer so what do you think transfer RNA is bringing? What is it transferring to the process? Ah, oh well, okay. So uh, well, I'll ask it a different way. This is something you definitely need to know. You've already been tested on it and will get tested again. What is the monomer of a protein? So for example, the monomer of a carbohydrate is a uh, saccharide, right? The monomer of uh, DNA, or excuse me, the monomer of a nucle nucleic acid is a nucleotide. So what is the monomer of a protein, this thing that we're trying to build? What are the building blocks of the things we're trying to build? Nothing? Oh, man. All right. Amino acids. You really need to know that. You needed to know it in Chapter 2. You need to know it again. Amino acids are what build a protein. A protein is just a bunch of amino acids str strung along and a big string that we call a polypeptide. And once that polypeptide forms its actual shape, then it is considered a protein. But yes, that's what tRNA is transferring. It is transferring the amino acid. Make sure you know that. And make sure you know that the polymer of, a, of an amino, of, excuse me, the polymer of a protein are amino acids. Make sure you know that. We talked about that on Wednesday or Monday. Yeah, I forgot which one, but yeah, we talked about it then. Remember there's 20 different amino acids? Anyway, let's keep moving forward and talk about this a little bit more. Um, obviously, if we're doing a translation, it requires an interpreter. So even if you're not talking about biology and you're talking about translating something, right? If you're talking about, I don't know, somebody from Korea comes to visit WVSU, um, you need a translator to you know, help them speak, right? To go from Korean to English. That would be an interpreter, right? But also in this situation, because we're doing translation, we also need an interpreter. We need to be able to convert this one that go from one language to the other, right? So the other language that we've been dealing with is these three letter nucleic acid words, right? Those are the codons. So to remind you, the language we've been dealing with, with the RNA and the DNA, those are all nucleic, that's a nucleic acid language, right? That it involves four letters. And those four letters are combined in different ways to make words. And all the words in that language are three letters long, right? And we call those things codons. And then those codons have to be translated into our um, protein. So the way it happens is, like I was saying earlier, it's the tRNA that reads the code and says, oh, you need this particular amino acid. So it brings that particular amino acid. So there's specific types of tRNA for each type of amino acid. So to remind you, there are 20 types of amino acids used to build proteins. Each one of them has their own tRNA. So that tRNA matches with it. It attaches to that one specific um, amino acid. And it reads the specific code on the RNA. and says, oh, that's me. That's my uh, amino acid. That's 
my job to bring this amino acid. Um, yeah. And also, as your book points out, I'm not necessarily going to ask you anything about this. But it's the structure of that tRNA that allows it to do that, right? It's the structure that allows it to attach to the, t, uh, to the amino acid. And it's the structure of the tRNA that allows it to read the code on the mRNA. And that's what we're going to talk about here in a second. But right now, the most important thing you need to understand is tRNA, again, that's the thing that brings in the amino acids. And again, amino acids are the thing that we need to build proteins. That's what this whole thing's about. Right, we're talking about going from DNA to RNA to protein. Well, this is the RNA to protein portion of the conversation. So we need the building blocks of the proteins, and that's what tRNA brings. tRNA transfers the amino acids. Any questions about this slide? All right. So here, like I said, it's all about that form, right? Form and function. It's all about the shape. Um, your book talks about it. I will, too. I have a whole slide about it, but I'm not necessarily going to ask you anything about the shape of tRNA. But just so you know, it's single-stranded, but it kind of folds up on itself, so it looks like it's double-stranded. You can see right here, that portion is double-stranded, this portion is double-stranded, this portion is double-stranded, this portion is double-stranded. You can see where those things have hydrogen bonded to themselves. But it's just one strand of tRNA. Um, and at one end is the end where it reads the code. The other end is the end where it attaches to the RNA, excuse me, the amino acid, but I'm not going to ask you any of that. The only thing you need to know for the exam is that tRNA is the thing that brings in the amino acids. That is the thing that is transferring the amino acids to the process. So any questions about that slide? All right. Like I already said on the previous slide, this is in writing now, but I already said it. At one end of the tRNA is a triplet of bases called the anticodon. I'm not going to ask you what an anticodon is, but I might use it. So that's why you need to know what it is. It is complementary to the codon on the mRNA. So if the mRNA, for example, if the code codon on the mRNA is CCG, then the anticodon would be the opposite of that, and it would be GGC. So again, I'm not going to probably ask you anything about the anticodon, but I might use that term when I'm describing this process, and you just need to know what it means when I use it. So that's one end of the uh, tRNA. At the other end, there's a specific, it's where the actual amino acid attaches. So remember, again, the whole purpose of the tRNA is to bring in the amino acids that we need to build a protein. And like I mentioned earlier, there's 20 different amino acids, and each amino acid has its own tRNA that recognizes that specific um, that specific amino acid and that specific code codon on the mRNA. Any questions about this slide? I'll show you a picture of what I'm talking about on this next slide. There it is. So this picture on the left is a little bit more accurate version of what it looks like, but the picture on the right is a more simplified version, and that's the one we usually use, right? That's what that's how we need to understand it. Nice and simple, the one on the right. So basically, again, like I said, here's your tRNA. At one end, you have the, the part where the, uh, the amino acid attaches. At the other end, you have the part that reads the code on the mRNA. It's pretty simple. Any questions about this slide? OK. Oh, another thing I point out, I'm definitely not going to ask you any questions where I like show you a tRNA and say, what part is this? What part is that? Where does the amino acid atta attach? Where, uh, where does the codon, the anticodon go? I'm not going to ask you any of that. Again, for the exam, what you need to understand is tRNA, this thing right here, is the thing that's transferring in the amino acids. I'm giving you all this detail, because the book did, but that's what you need to know for the exam, right? tRNA is the thing bringing in the amino acids. All right, then we talk about, or then the next up, the other part is something called a ribosome. You definitely need to know this. Ribosome is very important. It is the organelle that's doing the translating. In other words, ribosomes are the organelle that are bringing all the other parts together. So we've already talked about mRNA. We've already talked about the tRNA. I already mentioned briefly earlier that we need energy in the form of ATP, right? So it's these ribosomes that bring all that stuff together. It is the ribosome, if you will, that actually makes the polypeptide, which is the grand and the, the big picture. That's what we're after, right? This whole thing, going from DNA to RNA to protein, this is what we're after. So we're finally talking about the thing that does it. 
Um, there are two subunits. I'm not sure if I'm going to ask you to get that specific on the exam. You definitely need to know that ribosomes are the things that bring all the parts together to produce proteins. Um, and I might ask you if there's two subunits. So let's go ahead and talk about it very quickly. Um, each of the subunits, so even if I don't talk about the two different subunits, another way of saying this is ribosomes are made up of RNA and proteins mixed together. And here we go. Finally, the other type of RNA that you need to know about, the third and final that you need to know about is rRNA. So to remind you, the first type we talked about was mRNA, which is the messenger RNA, right? It's got the message coded from the DNA. Then we have the tRNA, which we just got finished talking about. That's the thing that's transferring the amino acids. And then finally, this last one that we're going to talk about is rRNA for ribosomal RNA. So again, the ribosome, this organelle that's doing all this business, it's made up of RNA and protein. And the specific type of RNA is called rRNA. Any questions about that? All right. Um, for independent work, you can look up the other types of RNA. I'm pretty sure your textbook talks about them too, so you don't even have to, you can just read your textbook. But yeah, there's other types of RNA that I don't, I'm not gonna ask you about on the exam. You can look them up for, uh, for independent work if you want. So anyway, like I said, these ribosomes, they're bringing all the parts together. They're doing the process, right? Um, so to do that, obviously, they need places for these things to come together. So these ribosomes have a binding site for the mRNA. Specifically, that's on the small subunit. And then everything else, like the tRNA, is attached to the large, sub, large subunit. So again, let me put a question mark next to this. I'm not sure if I'm going to get that detailed. You definitely need to know the ribosomes are the organelles that make up, uh, that produce the proteins. You definitely need to know that those ribosomes are made up of RNA and protein. You definitely need to know that the type of RNA that makes them up is rRNA. What you might need to know is that there's two subunits, and then it's a small subunit that the RNA attaches to. And it's the large subunit that the tRNA attaches to. That'll be more clear once I show you a picture. But are there any questions so far? All right. Here's a picture. Here's what I'm saying. There's a small subunit on the bottom. There's the larger subunit on the top. So, again, the small subunit attaches to the RNA. Right? Or, excuse me, the mRNA attaches to the small subunit. The tRNA attaches to the large subunit. I want to point this out, too. Uh, just in case any of you are really studious and you want to look into these things. If you were to look this up on the internet, depending on your source, it might look a little different. So you can see here there's an A site and a P site. I'm not really going to talk about those. I'm not going to test you on the difference between the A site and the P site. Your book talks about it. I'm not going to ask you to know the difference between the two. But anyway, the point I was about to make is if you look at other sources, there's actually a third site. So... Your textbook and this old textbook are simplifying it because this is a 100 level non-majors biology class. But just so you know, there's actually a third site on there that you just don't need to know about. You can look it up if you want, but the point being, if you're watching a video or reading some other source other than the textbook and you read about a third site, I don't want you to get, get confused. So any questions about this side? All right, this process on the right is what we're gonna talk about, right? So to remind you, we're still talking about translation, which is going from RNA to proteins. And we're still talking about just the parts. We haven't even gotten into the process yet. So we're just talking about the parts. So the parts are, this, you know, the ribosome, which is made up of the small subunit and the large subunit. And then we have the mRNA and the tRNA. And, of course, again, the tRNA is the thing that brings in the amino acids. Any questions about this so far? All right, now that we're done talking about the parts, let's talk about the process. Here's the good news. It's the same name as the transcription, right? So this is broken down into three stages and the, the names of the three stages are the same as transcription. So once you've memorized the name of the three stages of transcription, you've also memorized the, the, the name of the stages of translation. Initiation, elongation, and termination. So in a sense, that is easier, right? Because hey, you only had to memorize those, th those three words. But it does get a little bit more complicated because think about it. Transcription is going from DNA to RNA, 
right? Translation is going from RNA to proteins. So obviously, despite having the same name, it's going to be a different process. And you definitely need to know the difference between the two processes. There will definitely be questions where you need to know the difference between transcription and translation. So even though they have the same names, the same labels, they do different things. So let's talk about it. Initiation. That's the first step. Logically, this should make sense to you. Initiation is just the step where all the parts come together. So that's the whole thing we just got finished talking about with all the different parts, right? The mRNA, the tRNA, the ribosomes, the amino acids, right? The, the ATP, which for some reason we just keep leaving that out of the conversation. Um, but anyway, initiation just brings all those parts together. Specifically, as we already mentioned earlier, the mRNA attaches to the small subunit. And as mentioned earlier, it's the cap and the tail that help it bind to the ribosome. Obviously, too, we're going to need that first amino acid to come in, carried by the tRNA. And obviously, again, like I already mentioned, all the parts, the two parts of the ribosome. So, again, initiation is just bringing all the parts together. Now, when I ask you about initiation in that particular question, you don't necessarily need to memorize the fact that there's the cap and the tail that help it do that, right? So, if when you get a cap and tail question, I might ask you about why we have the cap and tail, in which case you would need to know. One of the reasons is to you know, help it recognize, be recognized by the ribosomes. But for the questions about translation, specifically about initiation, I'm not going to ask you to memorize the cap and tail part. So again, for the exam, an initiation of translation, that's all the parts are coming together. And in a sense, that's kind of similar to transcription initiation. Really, you're just bringing all the parts together. Of course, the parts were a lot simpler in that discussion because the parts were the DNA and the RNA polymerase that attaches to it to read it, right? So still the same situation. We're just bringing all the parts together. Any questions about this slide? Okay. There's the cap, there's, there's the mRNA. You can see the cap on one end, the tail on the other. Um, you can see where the start of the message is, the genetic start. So again, we're still talking about initiation. The mRNA, like we mentioned earlier, bonds the small subunit of the ribosome. And again, I put a question mark next to that when I first taught you that, because I'm not sure if I'm going to ask you that much detail. You, again, we're still talking about initiation. So you definitely need to know for initiation, all the parts are coming together. What I'm saying you might need to know specifically is that the mRNA attaches to the small subunit. I might ask you that. I might not know. Oh, this picture is not from your textbook. You can see now, because like I said, depending on your source, there might be a third spot right there that we don't talk about. Also, this picture from some other textbook also includes something we've never even talked about. GTP, as far as we're concerned, is the same as ATP. Anyway, none of that stuff will be on the exam. The point here is, again, initiation brings all the parts together. I might ask you the fact that the small subunit is the part that uh, the mRNA attaches to. And then before the large subunit even comes in, the tRNA comes in, right? So that's how it works. Again, I probably am not going to ask you that much detail. Most likely the question is just going to be for initiation. You just need to know that's what all the parts come together. And obviously you need to know what all the parts are. But again, if I were to get specific, which I might do, or maybe it would be a good extra credit question, is to know in what order these things happen. So again, mRNA attaches to the small subunit first. Then that first tRNA comes in, right? And then the large subunit comes in. So those are the order. That is the order of which I might ask you, maybe, you know, more likely for um, extra credit than anything else. But yes, that is what you need to know. And again, big picture, what you definitely need to know. Initiation just brings all the parts together. You got your ribosome, you got your tRNA, which is obviously attached to its um, amino acid, and you have the mRNA. Any questions about this slide? All right, the next word for attendance will be dad. Anyway, yeah, this picture, I don't know, I don't remember if this is from your textbook or the old textbook, but 
It's definitely not like the old textbook, the old pic that last picture I just showed you, because that was from a more complicated book. Here's a more simplified version. And again, it's very similar, right? Uh, as far as what you need to know for the exam, it's the same. You've got the mRNA that's attaching to the small subunit. You have the tRNA coming in with its specific amino acid. Um, and then after all that, then the large subunit of the ribosome comes in. So again, big picture for the exam, you definitely know that an initiation is what brings all the parts together. Maybe you need to know the order in which it happens. So again, mRNA attaches a small subunit, tRNA comes, and then the large subunit comes in. One thing you don't need to know, but your textbooks have been doing a great job of pointing this out, is that technically the first amino acid is always that one, the MET. You don't need to know that, but I wanted to point that out. That way when you're reading about it and looking at the pictures and studying, as I'm sure you guys often do, you'll see that and don't think, why do they keep mentioning that? Is it important? And in my opinion, no, it's not important. It is always that amino acid, but you don't, I'm, I'm not going to require you to know that. And again, I'm also not going to require you to know the difference between the P site or the A site. So any questions about that? Oh, yeah, one last thing. Sorry. Then the question is, all right, so we're still, we're talking about initiation. So if we're talking about the exam, what you need to know about initiation is it's bringing all the parts together, just like it does an in initiation of transcription. And just like an in initiation of transcription, one of the questions there is, where does it start, right? And the answer for that question would be at the promoter, right? That is the part of the, of the uh, DNA the RNA polymerase attaches to. In this situation, because this will definitely be a test question, where does the initiation of translation start? And the answer is the start codon. So you definitely need to know that. So if the question is about transcription, the answer would be promoter. The answer is about excuse me, if the question is about translation, the answer is start codon. So you definitely need to know those things. Definitely need to know the difference between the two. And again, your textbook was pretty specific about the fact that the first amino acid is this MET. And also, this ex example they use here, that's not random. That is always the first, um, well, not always, but as far as we're concerned, that's always the first code. But again, I'm not going to test you on that. For initiation, all the parts are coming together, and the process starts, at least on the mRNA, in a place called the start codon. Any questions? Okay. If you download the PowerPoint, you can see uh, an animation of everything we've just talked about. So here we go. Step two. So again, we're talking about translation, and translation is broken down into three steps, initiation, elongation, and trans uh, termination. We've already talked about initiation. Now we're talking about step two, which is elongation. And it's in the name. This part, pretty simple. Well, at first, I'm, I'm about to make it more complicated. But elongation just means what are we elongating? We're elongating that polypeptide, that string of amino acids. That's what we are elongating. We're bringing in amino acid after amino acid after amino acid, right? And just attaching them one into the other, right? That is what we are elongating. That part's easy. The harder part is the fact that it's broken. This part is also broken down into three steps. So again, translation, this whole thing of going from RNA to protein, is broken down into three steps: initiation, elongation, termination. And just to make things difficult for Bio 101 students, they also decided to break step two down into three steps. So step two, elongation, is broken down into three steps. So let's talk about them. I might ask you this about these three steps of elongation. Most likely I won't. Um, if I do, what you need to know is just the order in which it happens. In other words, I'm not going to say what happens in step one, what happens in step two, what happens in step three. But you would need to know, all right, first this happens, then this happens, then this happens. If I ask any questions, again, I probably won't about this whole step one, step two, step three. But if I do, I'm not going to ask you specifically in what step does this happen. You just need to know the order in which all this happens. So let's talk about it. Step one is the codon recognition. That should make sense, right? The first thing we need to do is read the mRNA, right? So that's the first step. Codon recognition. There's a codon in that mRNA. The tRNA recognizes it and says, oh, that's me, right? Because there's, again, there's a specific tRNA for each specific amino acid. So there's, you know, different varieties out there just floating around in the cytoplasm, and they need specific ones, right? So that's step one. 
it recognizes it and says, all right, that's my codon. That's my cue to come in and bring this specific amino acid. Any questions about step one? All right. Step two. This is where it gets a little bit more complicated. Once that tRNA brings in the amino acid, which is step one, then that new amino acid needs to attach itself to the other amino acids that are already there. Right? And that is the peptide bond formation. So you can see here, here we have this existing string of RNA, or excuse me, of amino acids that have already been built. Now we brought in this new tRNA with its amino acid, and they get attached. Notice, too, that the growing amino acid was in the P site, and the new amino acid was in the A site. I'm definitely 100% not going to ask you that on the exam for regular credit. Definitely don't need to know that it's, you know, you can see here, it basically it goes from the P site to the A site. If it was animated, that would be a lot cooler. What you would see is that that strand is no longer attached to that one in the P site. It would then be attached to that strand on the A site. But I'm not going to ask you that for the exam. Again, maybe, maybe for extra credit would you need to know that, but no, not really. Again, for the exam, long story short, step two of elongation is just the peptide bond formation, right? Is when you're attaching that new amino acid to the growing strand of amino acids. Step three, now we need to move things around, right? So like I said in this last one, that amino acid strand was attached to the tRNA that was in the P site, right? But what happens is it attaches to the other one, right? And then that TNA is no longer needed, so it just floats off and goes goes away and then the other one right this this one then moves over here back to that site and that's it so again most likely for the exam i'm not going to ask you about step one step two step three of elongation but i might um and again it should be pretty uh intuitive right obviously the trna needs to come in obviously the new amino acid needs to attach itself to the growing strand of amino acids. And then obviously the parts that are no longer, no longer needed, we believe. Which brings up a good question for independent work. Here I'm just telling you that tRNA just goes away. But what happens to it? What happens to that tRNA? It no longer has its amino acid. So what does the cell do with it? Does the cell just attach another amino acid to it? Does the cell just uh, digest it and use the parts to make something else? You can look that up for um, independent work if you want. So there's all the parts together, right? These are the three steps of elongation. That's all it is in one, one picture, right? So again, the new tRNA brings in the new amino acid. Then that new amino acid gets attached to the strand of growing amino acids. I guess a better way of saying that would be the strand of growing amino acids attaches itself to the new, um, the, the new amino acid. And then, of course, all the parts get shifted because we don't, we no longer need that tRNA. And then we need that spot open, so that tRNA moves over there, and that's it. So any questions about elongation? All right. The easy one is this one, the last part of translation, which is termination. Just like in transcription, it's the same thing in that this says, all right, job is done, we're done. And what happens in termination or transcription? All the parts go away, right? The mRNA leaves and does its thing. The uh, RNA polymerase detaches from the DNA and does its own thing. The DNA comes back together and does its own thing. Same thing in termination. All the parts just go away. What I'm definitely not going to ask you on the exam, except maybe, maybe, maybe for extra credit, is to know the codon that does this. You definitely need to know it's the stop codon where it happens. Um, and what you might need to know, or excuse me, what I might ask you about for extra credit is what the stop codons are. So UAA, UAG, and UGA. And here's a hint for you. Like I said earlier in the week, you might get a question where I ask you to translate the RNA, and I give you that wheel. Remember the wheel where it starts with the four codes, and then you move out to figure out what a polypeptide it is, excuse me, what amino acid. So if you get a question like this, and it says, hey, what are the stop codons? Because it's extra credit. If you don't remember, just go back and look at that thing. Look at that wheel, because I'm going to provide you with that wheel. So it'll tell you what the stop codons are.
Anyway, so again, just like in transcription, where does transcription stop? It stops at the terminator. Where does translation stop? It stops at the stop codon. And at that point, everything breaks free. Any questions about that? Again, this picture is not from your textbook. You can notice here that we have the, uh, the third spot that I haven't taught you about. Notice here that they get into the, how many um, GTP are used, and we, have, we don't even talk about GTP. Um, the next word for attendance will be stop. And that's it. That's where we'll stop. That's a good word for the last one. You guys have a good weekend. I'll see you on Monday. I see a lot of you have already done next week's exam uh, lab. Next week's lab is just like this. In that, if you've already done it, you don't need to come in. So unlike previously when I said I'll specifically tell you if you don't need to come in, I'm telling you now generally if you've done it, you don't need to come in. Any questions? All right.